Today what we're going to talk about is net ionic equations. And up until this point, what we've done is we've looked at molecular equations. And that's showing the compounds, the formulas for all of the compounds and elements in the reaction. Now what we want to do is we just want to show the, the actual changes that are taking place in a reaction. And that's what a net ionic equation does. So you can think of it as just a bridge, little notes, cliff notes or something for a chemical reaction. In order to do this, though, we need to know what parts of that reaction are going to break up entirely. So in other words, you're going to have compounds where it breaks up into ions, and we call that ionizing. And that happens when they're placed in water. So in order for us to understand what that means, we need to know something about phase notation. You know three of these pretty easily. You know solid, liquid, and gas, and we illustrate those with S, L, and G. For aqueous, this is a little bit different than liquid. Instead of just saying, if I had sodium chloride, for example, it's not that I take sodium chloride, heat it up to 12,000 and some odd degrees Celsius, and melt it and let it become liquid. It's not that. Instead, it's sodium chloride is taken and thrown into water, and it dissolves. It breaks apart into its ions. So when we have that situation, you would represent that with an AQ for aqueous. So a solution of salt water would be AQ for aqueous. OK, um, if it's just a simple element, if we're just talking about single elements, it's really easy. We can look at our periodic table that we have on our wall, and we can see that all of these guys over here, um, the, the black ones, are going to be solids at room temperature and standard conditions, standard temperatures and pressures. And we have a lot of red ones on there. Those are going to be your gases. It's going to be your noble gases. And a lot of those diatomics are going to be uh, in red, which so you would illustrate that with a G. And then finally, you just have two elements that you would have as liquids at standard conditions, and that's bromine and mercury. So the harder stuff comes in when you have an ionic compound. And what we refer to these as are salts. So salts, remember, are just ionic compounds. And if you were to take this substance, this ionic compound, and you throw it into water, if it's insol insoluble, like we have listed here, then that means it just lays at the bottom of the beaker and it doesn't ever dissolve. It doesn't break apart into those ions. So you would denote that with an S for solid, because it's just staying solid. It's not breaking apart into ions. But if you were to take this salt and you toss it into water, it's like magic, then it's a soluble salt if it does break into the ions, if it does dissolve. And the way you illustrate that is with an AQ for aqueous. Um, how do we figure this out? It's all based on solubility rules, and you don't have to memorize this until you get to AP chemistry. But just to remind you again, what we've been saying is that when you read through your solubility rules and you determine that something is soluble, then what that means is it's going to be aqueous. So it's AQ. If it's insoluble, it's going to be solid. And I would even write that down. I would say soluble equals AQ and insoluble, soluble equals S for solid. So you've got this nice list of solubility rules that you don't have to memorize. You just have to know how to use. And it's always going to be on your reference sheets that you have on the back of your periodic table. So you've got this list of stuff. Make sure you know what these things mean. Group 1, that's your alkali metals. Group 17, your halogens. Let's do a, an example. So if we wanted to determine if a salt is soluble or insoluble. First one, barium nitrate. Look at your rules. Anybody see a rule that this might apply to? Number four. Now, number four talks about sulfates. I'm not worried about sulfates so much. What am I worried about in this first example? Nitrates. So nitrates are addressed right here. And we see that all nitrates, this is one, this is these first two you'll probably memorize without even trying that you see all nitrates are always, always, always going to be soluble. So in this case, I look at that, it's soluble, so I would designate an AQ. Sodium sulfate. Again, I'm going to look at that one right there and see sodium is an alkali metal. 
and my rule number one tells me that all salts that have a group one element, in other words, an alkali metal in it, that's going to be soluble. So this one is also going to be AQ. What about the next one? Barium sulfate. What rule is that? Number four. So, yes, yeah, sulfates are mostly soluble, except you have a list that are not soluble. Is this one soluble or insoluble? Insoluble. So we're going to put an S because it remains solid. And then the last one, sodium, alkali metal, nitrate, always soluble, so that's an easy one, AQ. So you just have to get practiced in using your solubility rules. And um, if it's not a salt, if it's not an ionic compound, there's a good chance it might be a molecular or covalent compound. So we don't have very many of these. The ones that you should be familiar with are water. The big deal here is that since it's not an ionic compound, it can't break up into ions. So if it's water, it stays together as that whole entire molecule of water, H2O. It doesn't matter if you give it an L or a G unless it specifically um, dictates what the, the phase is. But you're going to treat these guys the same, whether it's a liquid or a gas. It might be steam. It might be liquid water. Carbon dioxide is another case that you might come across. can't break that apart into its ions. It has to stay together as carbon dioxide, and that's a gas. Ammonia is another one. I guess you could see something like sulfur dioxide. We've seen some special cases where you have a sulfur dioxide gas, SO2. That's another possibility. You guys should be able to recognize that those are not ionic compounds. They are molecules. They stay together. Acids, these are ionic, but they have some special rules to them. And the first thing is that all ionic all acids are going to be aqueous. Every single acid is aqueous. However, not every single acid breaks apart entirely when it's thrown into water. So in order to determine that, we have to figure out if it is a strong or a weak acid. So I think I'd probably jot this down. That a strong acid is going to be... Um, a strong acid is going to break apart completely. Breaks, I didn't do that right. Breaks apart, sorry. Breaks apart completely when it's tossed in water. Whereas a weak acid, only a really small percentage of it is going to break apart. So I'm just going to say, does not break apart. At least not completely. So we're just going to keep that together as an entire molecule. So that's the first thing we need to know is we have to figure out if something's strong or weak, if that acid's strong or weak. And the way we do that, there are some rules. For our binary acids, there are three strong binary acids. And the way that you might want to remember these, if you know your diatomics, I bring clay for our new house, just remember those. HI, HBr, and H. CL. So it's the first three, I bring clay. Those are your strong binary acids. The rest of your binary acids are going to be weak. As far as your um, ternary acids go, for these guys, that's going to be when you have an oxygen in there because you've got a polyatomic ion bonded with your hydrogen. We're going to see that our strong acids have at least two more oxygens than hydrogens. So, for example, if you had something like sulfuric acid, H2SO4, there are four oxygens and two hydrogens. So because of that, you've got two more oxygens than hydrogens. That would be strong. Whereas sulfurous acid with three oxygens and two hydrogens, that's going to be weak. And then the last little thing to know is that whenever you have an organic acid, and that would be um, seen as having carbon in there, so hydrogen with carbon, that's always going to be weak. So we know that none of those will be considered strong acids. So that's how we figure out our phase notation based on all of that information. So now we can look at um, an example of a net ionic. I'm going to pause this and I'm going to show my class an example of where 
um, actually, well, I'm just going to pause it. We're going to see a different a reaction on the board. Okay, so we just saw why we use net ionics, and I showed this off camera, but um, we looked at a situation where we had iron that was solid went into solution, copper that was in solution came out of solution. So it kind of illustrated a little bit as to why we go through this. Here is an example that you guys have. You've got this on your sheet, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. But basically what happens, you start with your reactants, you throw them all into a beaker, and we form barium sulfate and sodium nitrate in this situation. Notice that your barium sulfate is not soluble. So it hangs out down there at the bottom of your beaker, doesn't dissolve, and instead you have sodium ions and nitrate ions floating around in the beaker. So when you write your net ionic equation for this, it ends up being barium ions plus sulfate ions yield barium sulfate that's solid. So that's what we're seeing. That's the true change that takes place. I'm going to let you guys on your own time kind of go through this because you've got it all written out for you. And we're going to spend time on the back side, which is more examples. Okay, so the first one, we have magnesium sulfate plus lead to nitrate. We know this is a double replacement reaction. We're getting pretty good about um, just double checking. See if it's a special case, just because come test time, of course, you're going to have them all mixed together. But you see that there's nothing special about this. It's just going to be a normal double replacement. Forms magnesium nitrate plus lead to sulfate. If it's lead to on the left, it's got to stay lead to on the right. So there we go. It's our molecular equation. We go through and we balance it. Poof, it's balanced. Right? And then we come back and we write phase notation. So this is step one, is to write a balanced chemical equation with phase notation. So for this, you're going to want to have your solubility chart in front of you, that reference sheet. Magnesium sulfate. I think we said sulfates were rule number four, if you want to look at that. Do we see anything? What would you say about that? Is it? It's soluble, so we're going to say aqueous. What about nitrates? Soluble, so AQ. Nitrates, AQ. What about lead to sulfate? Solid, because it is not soluble. So we have done step one, which is balanced chemical equation with phase notation. Now, It's, the lead to sulfate is solid because if you look at rule number four, it says that sulfates are soluble for the most part, except for, and it gives some examples, and lead to is one of those examples. Okay, so now that we've got it to this point, we break it apart into that complete or gross ionic equation. In other words, anything that is aqueous ionizes, breaks apart into those ions. So we have, and this is where you have to kind of write small and just be detail minded because you have to write both your charge of your ions and your phase notation. So it breaks into Mg plus 2 that is aqueous plus SO4 minus 2 that is aqueous plus Pb plus 2 aqueous. How many nitrates? Plus 2 nitrates. Good. Plus 2 NO3 minus 1 aqueous yields Mg plus 2 aqueous plus 2 NO3 minus 1s aqueous and then finally that last one it's solid so you cannot break that apart into its ions it remains together as PbSO4 that is solid that's the hard part now you do the easy part are spectator ions, the guys that don't have any role in the reaction. Um, see any? Okay, nitrates go away. Anything else? Okay, those magnesium ions. In other words, everything, those guys are all exactly the same on each side of that reaction. So we cancel those out. Those are our spectator ions. Last step is to just rewrite everything 
um, including charges and phases for your net ionic. So what didn't cancel out, which is SO4 minus 2 aqueous plus PB plus 2 aqueous. And that yields PB SO4 solid. So that is the real um, change that took place in our reaction. The sulfate ions and the lead 2 ions combine to form an insoluble precipitate. Okay, so we had a couple good questions on that one. Um, next one, hydrochloric acid plus sodium hydroxide. HCl plus NaOH, double replacement reaction, nothing fancy about it, just forms sodium chloride plus water. So everything's plus one, minus one, easy to balance. It's balanced. Then we write our phase notation. Hydrochloric acid, what would you say about that? Uh, aqueous. It's aqueous because it's an acid, and I heard it's strong, which is going to be really important. So what I would do is I would write myself a note about that right on top. Write the word strong right on top. Here I have hydroxides. What do I know about hydroxides? It is a base, but as far as solubility goes, it's, it's usually insoluble, except for, exactly, so we've got an alkali metal there. What I want you guys to do is get into the habit even of just looking at that and saying, there's an alkali metal. It's got to be aqueous. Alkali metal makes it aqueous if you read through those rules, yeah. So alkali metal, aqueous. The last one, what would we say for H2O? Liquid. If you threw in gas, that would be fine. doesn't matter. You really get the same results. So we have just done step one. Step two, we break apart anything that is aqueous. And if it's an acid, it has to be strong aqueous. And that's the case here. So it's going to be H plus 1 AQ plus Cl minus 1 AQ plus Na plus 1 AQ plus OH minus 1 AQ yields Na plus 1 AQ plus Cl minus 1 AQ plus H2O liquid. Okay, so name a spectator. And NA. Okay, so those are our spectators, meaning what's really going on. By the way, let me go back to this reaction, this molecular equation. It's a double replacement reaction. It is kind of a special double replacement reaction, even though nothing special happened. You didn't have to think about anything in particular. What did we call this type of reaction? Anybody remember? What do you call that? Acid, acid plus a base yields a salt plus water. It's on the tip of your tongue. It's a neutralization reaction. So a neutralization reaction, because really what we did, we took that acid, we took that base, we neutralized it. If all the conditions were perfect, you'd have a neutral pH of your salt, and you'd just have some water. So the real thing that we did is we just took those hydrogen ions, combined them with our hydroxide ions, and formed a water molecule. And that's it. That's your net ionic equation. Okay, next one. Sodium chloride plus nitric acid. And in this case, another double replacement. We're going to get sodium nitrate plus hydrochloric acid. All of these are plus one, minus ones. Makes the no fun. You don't get to balance, but there you go. Everything's balanced already. Then we do our phase notation. Sodium chloride. Quick, what is it? Uh, aqueous. 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 Nitric acid. Aqueous. And is it strong or weak? Strong, at least two more oxygens than hydrogens. That one's strong. Um, sodium nitrate. 
aqueous. Hydrochloric acid. Aqueous. And it's strong. Huh. I don't like to do more work than I have to do. So in this next step, see if you guys can just think about this. What would happen? Remember, your next step is to break apart anything that's aqueous that can be broken apart, which is everything here. Then you cancel out your spectator ions and you rewrite your net ionic equation. So what would happen in this case? Everything would cancel, right? When you broke apart to your ions, you'd be cancel, 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 cancel. You'd be canceling all of those. They'd, they would all be spectator ions. So maybe we'll write ourselves a note about that. I don't plan on um, writing that second equation because we don't need to. I need to see this. If this was on a quiz or a test, you need to write that molecular equation balanced with phase notation. But what's happening is everything cancels. So therefore, what would you have left over in your net ionic? Nothing. So it would be no reaction. What would really happen if you threw aqueous sodium chloride in with aqueous uh, nitric acid? What do you get? You get a beaker full of these hydrogen ions, some chloride ions, some sodium ions, some nitrate ions, all floating around hanging out in that beaker together. They don't form a precipitate. They don't form a gas. They don't form anything. They just hang around in that beaker. So that would be considered no reaction. Okay, next one. Here we have sodium nitrate plus lead to iodide. I, can, I like this one, but I wish it was in the opposite direction because it would look very familiar to you guys since you just did it yesterday in lab. Um, double replacement reaction, but you did it in the opposite direction, which really makes more sense. But double replacement reaction where we get sodium iodide plus lead to nitrate. Okay. Balanced, and I guess I have to balance it. There's that and that. Then we come back and do phase notation. Easy. Alkali metal, nitrate, we know that one's going to be aqueous. Probably have to look this one up. What do you see? Um... Is it aqueous? Oh, no. Right, so you see that your halogen, what number is this? Number two? Three. three? Okay, so it tells you somewhere in there, I don't have it in front of me, but you've got this, um, yeah, you've got your iodine and it's combined with your lead too, so that's going to be solid. Okay, sodium iodide, that's going to be aqueous because um, alkali metal, and then nitrate, that's going to be aqueous. So now when you break this apart, you end up getting two sodium ions that are aqueous plus two nitrate ions that are aqueous plus PBI2. Hey, based on yesterday's lab, what color is PBI2? What color? Yellow, real bright, bold yellow. So that's what you saw with that one. Um, here we get two sodium plus one ions hmm? plus two iodide ions plus PB plus two AQ plus two nitrate ions. So now we've got it to this point, we can cancel out, cancel out our spectators. Who's a spectator? Sodium. Nitrates. And that's it. So what we end up seeing, that beautiful bold yellow precipitate that we saw yesterday, well, that was formed from those um, iodide ions combining with the lead two. Ions. So there is our net ionic equation. Okay, I just had a great question about, hey, why would you really even have to write all of this stuff out in here? Because you can look up at that molecular equation up top and figure out really what the charge is or what the final equation is. So in black, I'm going to show you a way to go about thinking about that. 
So I would look, once you've got your molecular equation written, you've got to do that, so your molecular equation's written, then you look at this and you come back, remember, for your aqueous substances, that means that they can break apart. So why not look at that and say, well, that breaks into two sodium ions and two nitrate ions. Sodium iodide, that breaks into two sodium ions and two iodide ions. Here, this breaks into a lead ion and two nitrate ions. So even just seeing it in your molecular equation, you could probably say, yeah, sodium ions, those guys, they're spectators. What else do you see as a spectator? Nitrates, bye-bye. Notice that nothing else can cancel. So what you're left with, let me see if I can get this. What you're left with is this, and you've got your iodide ions, there's two of them, and you've got your lead ions, there's just one of them, but you have to come back when you do your, um, your final net ionic, and you have to write your charges with those guys. So once you finish with what we just did, you would come back and say, okay, so PBI2 that is solid goes into two iodide ions, so remember you have to write your charge, AQ, plus a PB with a plus two that is aqueous. So you have to remember to get your charges in there. Okay, here's our last one. In this case, we're going to take potassium, which is K, plus calcium fluoride yields. That's a single replacement reaction. Potassium's up here, calcium's down here, so it does take place. We get calcium fluoride, no, potassium fluoride plus calcium. We come back and we balance. And we throw in some phase notation. Well, potassium, that's solid. Calcium, that's solid. I can just look at my periodic table and see that. Now, this, the wording might sound a little tricky on your um, solubility rules there. What number is that? I don't remember. Three. three? So if you look at rule number three, it talks about your, basically your halogens, and all of them being soluble, except for, I should grab one of these. It talks about them being soluble, um, it, the binary compounds for your halogens, other than fluorine, are soluble except for a few of them. What that means is that fluorine is not going to be soluble. So this case right here, I'm going to say solid. But what about this one? What do you think I'm going to say? Uh, aqueous because it's an alkali. Awesome. So alkali metal means that that one's aqueous. So that's what we end up seeing there. Okay, so what we end up seeing... This is the only one that breaks apart into ions. So you get 2K that's solid plus CaF2 that's solid yields two ions, 2K plus ones that are aqueous plus 2F minus ones that are aqueous plus Ca solid. Anything cancel out? No. Nothing cancels out, so our second step ends up being our third step as well. This is our net ionic equation because nothing cancels out. Real quick. Okay, last little question was, um, can you cancel the aqueous with the solids? And absolutely not. Nothing cancels. And then what you end up seeing, this is not on your notes, but what you guys end up seeing is these are the types of reactions that you would expect. Single replacements, your cations or anions can be replaced. Du <coughs> double replacements, oftentimes you'll get some sort of precipitate formed or you'll form water or no reaction will take place. Bye-bye.